Muslim scriptures use the word nikah, which means sexual interest, intercourse, literally, to mean marriage. The dowry is mentioned very important. A, a woman must get a dowry in exchange for her sexual organs. That's, I'm quoting the meaning of dowry in Muslim scriptures. And it's called ujur. Dowry is called ujur. Means, what does ujur mean? Means wage. So she's practically a, a slave, a sexual slave. Um, and slavery was never abolished under Islamic law. A man is allowed to have sex with slave women. Sexual slavery is allowed. And women captured in battle, if they are married, they are automatically, their marriage is annulled. And these are all laws in, in, in Islam that must never change because this is Allah's law, you cannot touch it. Uh, in, in 1962, Saudi Arabia was practicing, uh, up to 1962, was practicing slavery legally. And if it wasn't for Western culture and the Judeo-Christian culture embarrassing Saudi Arabia for abolishing it, it would have been practicing it until today. In 1962, there were riots in Mecca and Medina by people who owned slaves and, and said, how can you uh, make something in Sharia illegal? Uh, and this is Islamic law. And uh, uh, Islam never abolished slavery. The testimony of a woman in court is half the value of a man. So if a woman and a man go to court against one another, guess who wins? <coughs> Automatically wins. It's the man. The revered Muslim theologian, Imam Ghazal, he is a very prominent theologian. He's practically number two after Muhammad. Imam Ghazali, he defined marriage for generations of Muslims. And I'm quoting him. Marriage is a form of slavery. The woman is, uh, is man's slave and her duty therefore is absolute obedience to the husband and all, the, uh, all he asks for uh, of her. This is how uh, many young men are brought up to, to view marriage in the Muslim world. For a Muslim wo woman to prove rape under Islamic law, she must have four male witnesses. If you don't have four male witnesses testifying that you have been raped, you better shut up and never report it. Because if you report it and you don't have any proof, you must have admitted adultery, which is against the law. So that's why Rape is hardly ever reported in, in the Muslim world. A woman, uh, a Muslim woman must cover every inch of her body since it, under uh, Islamic law and by Ghazali, Imam Ghazali himself, stated that every part of a woman's body is aura, <coughs> meaning a vagina. It is, it's, a, it's an aura, it's an it, it should not be exposed. And, uh, and that is why it has to be covered. A woman cannot leave the home without her husband's permission and cannot befriend any other women if the husband doesn't approve of that woman. Let's say if she has a friend who's a little bit of a feminist. Let me tell you, she will not be defend her anymore. She's, she's a rebellious woman against Islam. Feminists are shunned in Muslim society. There is a, a well-known feminist in Egypt um, who had to leave the country because she was uh, 
A death, a death sentence was issued against her. Uh, very few feminists dare to be, to be really feminists in the Muslim and live inside the Muslim world because you'll be branded immediately as, uh, as uh, having been an apostate. You become an apostate. If you advocate uh, equal rights like men, it's against Sharia, it's against Islamic law. And you are advocating something that is uh, against Islam. You become shunned immediately in society. Uh, this, this is a condition of really gender apartheid. Women deal with women, mostly family members, and men deal with men. Everything is more or less split. You know, and, uh, you know there are some weddings, they're split, they're, so, social events are split, gender. You find yourself dealing only with women, and not all women. The ones that your husband doesn't want you to, to associate with, you, you can't associate with. You only associate with uh, covered women who cover their head. I know people in, in Egypt, uh, actually cousins, who, whose husband told her, don't associate this with, with this woman, she doesn't cover her head. So, uh, it limits it limits them, it isolates them. It, uh, it, it makes it impossible for women to get together, to demand their rights and end up the state of, this state of, of, of uh, uh, you know, gender apartheid. It's by design, it's all by design to, to really enslave women. And unfortunately, many women who want to be devout Muslims, who want to be good, good women, believe that this is what God wants. This is Allah. Allah wants us to be like that. We have to expect, accept our inferior status. This is what Allah wants from us. And they end up becoming the jailers of their own prison. It, it almost becomes like a Stockholm Syndrome. You embrace the ideology that is imprisoning you. You embrace your own prison and think and believe really that you're doing the right thing. Uh, Muslim scriptures describe women as deficient in intellect and faith. Uh, Imam Ghazali, he describes women as toys, crooked, half devil, harmful, and detrimental to men. Believe it or not, regarding abortion, abortion was never uh, been be made illegal under Islam. And that's why there are abortion clinics in Egypt. It's not an epidemic because they like to have kids there, but it's not illegal. Um, and many, many women, when they have an abortion in Egypt, Egypt they casually say, I had a courtage. They, they call it the French name. I, I had a courtage last week. Oh, are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. That's it. So um, that may be a lesson to us that whether, whether uh, abortion is legal or not, it, it, can, it will be performed. And the most important thing really is to promote the moral uh, and the education of girls to find another way for birth control and, 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 and help, help society understand more than uh, make it legal or illegal. It's not a matter of legal and illegal because everything can be done, in my opinion. Uh, uh, there is also, in Egypt, uh, especially in Egypt, uh, female genital mutilation. 97% uh, of Egyptian women my mother's age, 97% has undergone this operation, including my own mother. And I didn't know that uh, this happened to her. Thank God she didn't do it to us. But I asked her, uh, very recently, mom, by the way, have you uh, undergone this? And she didn't answer. It was too painful for her to talk about it. And then she said, yeah. 
And um, <coughs> I witnessed honor killing of girls, female genital mutilation. I witnessed polygamy and its devastating effects on family dynamics, on how women and men relate to each other. Because when the laws are against you, you compromise a lot. You give up your rights a lot. And you think you're doing it because you're a good Muslim woman. And that is the problem. And like the Egyptian feminist movement, time has not served American feminist movement very well. It has become stagnant into partisan politics more than true women issues. It has become anti-male. It's almost like I have to snatch my rights from men. It's, it's not like my rights are inside me. I'm a human being. The laws in America are on my side. And nobody can, can, can stop me from exercising my dignity as a woman, as a human being. But it, uh, I, I noticed that the feminist movement in America has, has really become anti-male. And my rights have nothing to do with males. <clears throat> it has everything to do with the law. And if the law is right, my rights are going to be okay. It has also become pro-abortion in a country whose population, the West, the population in Europe and America without immigration would be decreasing. We need to populate this country. And it's, it's very important that we look at that, of transmitting the culture to the next generation. Uh, having children, in my opinion, is a privilege. And we can still be uh, liberated women and uh, we don't have to be against having children or uh, looking down at the role of mother, motherhood. Um, one of my first experiences in America uh, was at a lecture in Berkeley, actually. Uh, I was still a newcomer to America. And it was, um, there was a woman who was sitting, it was a church, and she was speaking about the glass ceiling and how they can be, uh, she was, there was a, a large group of young girls surrounding her. Actually, many of them were sitting on the floor. And she was speaking about her personal experience and how she wanted, she was like 40 years old. It wasn't like she was very old. She wanted to be a doctor, but American society didn't give her the opportunity. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing and felt bad for the young girls who are being taught to blame others and to the victimhood mentality. I don't want to feel a victim. I never cared to feel as a victim, even though I was living under Sharia, Islamic law. And, and uh, I don't think there are any laws in America against educating women like in some Muslim countries. In, in my country, your rights, you have to snatch it. And I have a sister who's a physician. My cousin, I have another physician. In Egypt, they all strive to have it. Nothing stopped them. And I have many relatives, women relatives in Egypt, cousins, who are PhDs in physics and in uh, economics. Uh, and I was just looking at this and I'm saying, am I, where am I? These women have every opportunity legally in every way. American universities have more, more <laughs> attendance, more student female attendance than males. There's nothing stopping them. There's nothing stopping you. And I would have preferred that this woman stood there and inspired those young women by saying, we have the laws with us, we have supportive families, we can do it, you can do it, and inspire these young girls. But what I felt was she was making these girls feel victimized and feel bitter and angry at their own country. 
And that was not positive at all. American parents are not forcing their daughters to have an early marriage, depriving them of their dream education. What was she talking about, I thought. I, I then asked myself, how could that be in America? How could that be? Why? These are communities in America that reach the highest level of education around Berkeley University, of Berkeley, UC Berkeley. And this is not the kind of message we want to give our young girls. I, with all my relatives in Egypt who are doctors and, and very successful, all the, uh, in the poverty-stricken Middle East, the only way to have food on the table, to have a little dignity, a little respect in society, was to have, you have to have a degree. You have to have a, a, a university degree. The alternative is to belong to the majority, depressed, poor, very poor classes, oppressed classes. And in Egypt, unlike the United States in the old days, it was racial problems. No, Egypt is class. The, the, the poor classes are so oppressed until today. They're the same race, but they treat them like slaves. And if you don't have a university degree, you will belong to that class. And that's why many women want to get that university degree in order to not be uh, the victim of oppression. Uh, and uh, I, I then wondered why this Berkeley woman was blaming America for not being a doctor. What really stopped her? Was it her parents? Was it that the university didn't give her a grant? Was it that the government didn't give her a student loan? Was she didn't, what was it? Could it be that women in, in, in a wealthy society like, or I, I, in a wealthy society like America, they were not desperate under dire circumstances to be driven to become a doctor or engineer. They were not. And maybe that's the reason. Even if you don't have a degree in America, you can still have a good job. You can still prosper. You can still be respected in the community. There's an alternative. Now, unlike the Middle East, where you have to scratch the, the wall to reach something that will, will save you from being uh, in the lower classes where they are stepped on like bugs, practically. Could it be that they are already respected in America and can make a decent living without having to go to study medical school seven more years to become a doctor? Could it be that America has given women the luxury to choose not to be a doctor? 